So Lord, we realize there's going to be some hard days. There's going to be some tough seasons. But you're for us and those tough times are actually going to help us in the long run. So may we accept that by faith. And Lord, as a church, we want to we want to move with the leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you're the head of the church. We're your people. So God, would you continue to give us vision, to give us courage, to carry the name of Jesus into the earth. Lord, would you speak to us this morning? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. If you want to, you can make your way to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We've got a one-off. This morning is Vision Sunday. Once a year, we want to have kind of a family talk, uh, kind of talk about who we are, where we've been, where we're going by God's grace. And uh, so we're going to get into some nuts and bolts um, of kind of how things work around here. If, if, um, if you're new to Lighthouse or fairly new, um, you're... You know, we're going to try and move you from the entryway into the living room this morning. And, uh, and we're going to talk about a number of things. So I've got about six things to share with you this morning. Uh, and the first thing, um, actually, before we get to that, I need to let you know. Um, on September 9th, uh, which is two weeks from, is that right? From to, No, it's more than that. Three, three weeks from today. Uh, we are having church at the park. That's at the city park. And, and it'll be at 1030. And so um, we're going to, you know, do full-on worship service out in the open air there at the Twin Falls City Park. And then afterwards, we're going to have a barbecue and picnic and uh, free burgers and dogs for everybody. And, um, and so we need to do this as a church. It takes a lot of us. Uh, to kind of pull this off. And so um, if you would be willing to volunteer and serve uh, at Church at the Park, you know, serving food or whatever, man, we, we need you. We would love to have you. So if you're willing to get involved, stop at the Connection Center and uh, get signed up for that. Then secondly, um, after service today, if you want to, the back building is open for you, open house back there. So if you want to go wander into the building, wander around, see what God has done in the last, oh, it's been about a year plus of this latest, latest renovation back there. And so it's really quite exciting. And so school kicked in for Lighthouse Christian School on Thursday. And so um, the building is flowing and going. And, uh, but that building is not just for the school. It's for the church. There's a worship center back there. And you'll see we'll be doing stuff back there as a church as well. And so if you want to just go wander around, there'll be people back there as well that will lead you and, and give you a guided tour if you want it. So um, head back to the back building after service today. I think you'll enjoy that. Then, um, so we're calling today Vision Sunday, and uh, the first thing I want to kind of just put out there for us all is from 1 Corinthians 3, is that if you're a follower of Jesus, you are a co-worker. We are co-workers together with Jesus, and that's 1 Corinthians 3, verse 8. He who plants and he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is now building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is... Jesus Christ. So there's a bunch of truth packed in to these few verses here. And I want to bring just four quick, really quick truths that I want us to let seep into our heart. The first one is that followers of Jesus are workers with Jesus. Okay, so once you become a follower of Jesus, you are commissioned into the fields. You carry the name of Jesus, the presence of God with you wherever you go, 
and you are called to be a worker. So when Paul says we there, he means himself and the believers in Corinth and by extension now in the 21st century, the believers at Lighthouse Church. We are fellow workers. Now, what is our work? What is this labor that we are called to do? Well, we are called to build the church. That's verse 9. You are God's field, God's building. So we work together to build the church, God's building. What does that mean? Well, Paul will say uh, down in verse 16 that you, meaning the local church at Corinth, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, in chapter 6, he'll say that individual believers are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But he also says local churches are temples of the Holy Spirit being built So our work is to build the church, build the church universal. And isn't it awesome? I think about this a lot, that all over planet Earth today, there's people gathering like this to honor Jesus, to worship him, to hear his word proclaimed and taught, to receive the table, to repent of our sin, to be reignited and reinvigorated. And we're a part of the church universal, but we build the church universal. How? By building our church local. And so we are builders of the church. After Peter made his grand proclamation about the identity of Jesus, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Way to go, Peter, flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I will build my church. Upon what rock? The rock of his confession. His confession about the true identity of Jesus Christ. Paul would write in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord... And believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be what? Saved. The church is built when people like you, like me, say yes to Jesus. You are Lord. And not just a Lord, but my Lord. One confession at a time. The church is built. And the gates of hell, Jesus said, will not prevail against her. The gates of hell can't hold the church back. So we build the church. It's all of our work. We don't do it the same. Some plant and some water. But this is God's great endeavor. This is his great story. It's the story of the ages. The bride who is betrothed to God the Son. That's what this work is about. And we're all in it. Every one of us who name Christ as Lord. And so that leads us to the third thing. We're to be thoughtful about that. That's verse 10. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. Someone else is building on it. Let each one take care how he builds. So Paul says, I'm a master builder, an architect of the church. I've laid the foundation. Me and the other apostles have laid the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, if the foundation isn't Jesus, it isn't a church. So I've laid the foundation. Now others are building on it. And so let those who build on it be careful how they build. Be careful what materials you use. That's later down in the chapter, right? Because if you use shoddy materials, they'll burn up in the judgment. But if you use good materials, the gold and the silver, the lasting materials, they will endure the testing and become reward for you. And so we're to be thoughtful about that. What is my relationship to my church, my local church? If I'm called by God to be a builder of the church universal by being a builder of the church local, 
by carrying the name of Jesus into the people, into the you know, places of my life, the home, school, work, marketplace, and all of that, then, then am I a waterer? Am I a planter? What do I do? I want to do it well for the Lord. I want my works to pass through the fire and turn into reward for me. So be thoughtful about it. Because, and that's the fourth thing, we, we will receive reward for what we do. That's verse 8. He who plants, he who waters are one. Each will receive his wages according to his labor. Now, even though we're, we're all builders of the church, church universal, by being builders of the church local, each of us will individually give an account to the Lord for our work. And so, we are all workers, and so wise is the person who uses precious materials in their building of the church. Well, that brings us to the second thing this morning, and that is our style. I want to talk about this just a little bit with you. There isn't one way to do church. Did you know that? There isn't just one way to do it. Now, there's certain things that should be a part of every church that names the name of Jesus and believes the Bible to be the very word of God. There's certain things that should be a part of those churches. But there's certain things that, that are, are, are just, it's just style. It's the more transitory elements of what we do, like the style of the music or the expectations of how we dress when we come to church or the methods of helping people grow in their faith. All of those things can kind of change and be different. And there isn't necessarily a right and a wrong about those things. So... There's more than one way to do all of that. And, and some people will resonate more with this kind of style and others will resonate more with this kind of style and that's okay. That's actually a good thing. It doesn't mean that one is better. There's an ongoing debate over what is the best methodology for doing church and reaching our communities for Christ. And so a, a pretty fairly recent phenomenon, I guess, I, we could probably trace this back far if we wanted to, but, but it really kind of hit, you know, last century and is with us today big, and that's the attractional method, the attractional. That is, make our church and our services attractive. You invite somebody who doesn't know Jesus to your church, and they're not going to be, like, freaked out too bad, you know? They're... It's, it's going to be attractive. They're going to go, oh, okay, this is pretty cool or whatever. You know, it's, a, it's attractive. So, so the, the critics of this will say, you know, church, churches like that, they often water down the Bible and the messages, and they, they kind of bend the sermon around the seeker and not the, the believer. And so the result is there's a lack of depth in the Christian and and, and the, the more offensive or difficult truths of the Bible are avoided because of the seeker. And, and so the, the believers kind of suffer and they stay in, in the shallow waters or whatever. And, and then another kind of a knock on the attractional method is that it blurs the line between church gathered and church scattered. Church gathered, that's what we're doing right now. We come together, we worship God, we love the Lord through song, prayer. We hear his word spoken over us, spoken to us. We come to the table and receive the bread and the wine. We are the church gathered, his saints together. And then at the end of the service, it's like a salt shaker. We're shaken out of the salt shaker into our communities to carry Jesus out there. And so the critics of the attractional method says it blurs all that. If everybody, who knows, who knows Jesus in here, and if it's not just the church and it's everybody, whatever, it kind of blurs it. The missional, the other approach, the missional approach says that the church gathers for worship and the word and sacraments and so on, then scatters for missional ministry within the community. So the gathering isn't geared toward the seeker, but totally for the believer, the follower of Jesus. Evangelism is done out there, not in here. 
Because as we scatter, we take Jesus with us and we do the evangelism. We make relationships in our schools and workplace and we desire to lead people into a relationship with Christ who then become a part of the church. So, which is it? <laughs> is it attractional or is it missional? Well, our church has not, we've not taken an either or approach to this. We've taken a both and. And so we believe that church should be approachable and it should be inviting and attractive. We pursue excellence in what we do. You know, Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do with all of your heart as unto the Lord. Whatever we do, that's a mantra for us. Whatever we do, we wanna do it to the best of our abilities, not to the least of our abilities or take the easiest way around. We wanna do it the best for the Lord. And so, we do our best, however, to maintain fidelity with the scripture. We don't want to take a passage of the Bible and then kind of cherry pick and go, okay, this is, this is good for seekers, this is good for seekers. Oh, want to avoid that guy right there. That's a hard truth. We don't do that. So, so we want to go to any given passage and, and we want to know what is this saying? What is, this, what is God saying to us in this chapter, in this passage? I want to find that out and then, and then be able to share that and so that we can hear what God is actually saying in his word, trusting that God will meet the needs of his people through his actual word and not just saying things about his word. And so we want to maintain that fidelity with, with the Bible. And that's why our, our main modus operandi here is we teach through books of the Bible. Not always. We'll do topical, you know, sermon series now and then. But mainly we go through books of the Bible because then as you go through a book of the Bible, you get its background, you get the context, you get, who, you know, who wrote it, when it was written, who was it written to. And then all of a sudden, as you navigate your way through that book, you come to these verses these, and you have all of this, this knowledge behind you that informs your, you know, particular text. And, and so verses aren't being pulled out of their context and made to mean something that they don't mean. And so the, the, the truth unfolds to us us more naturally and more accurately, I think. And so we're committed to that. And while we, we often invite people to put their faith in Jesus here in the service, we, we are evangelistic in our church service. We teach a missional, incarnational life that if you, are, if you belong to the Lord, that you should be living on mission. That you, you want to lead people to Jesus and whether that's by, you know, inviting them to church or just being a great neighbor. But you think about that. Man, I'm got certain people I'm going to run into tomorrow, and man, I just want to pray for them, and I care about their eternal destiny. And you know, I was talking last last week after one of the services, and a, a dear sister in Christ came up and said, "You know, we were me and my husband were on a trip, and highlight of the trip it was a great trip, but the highlight of the trip was when we led my aunt to the Lord." <laughs> Led her to Jesus, and she's like weeping, and like, wow, that's being missional. That's that's carrying the name of Jesus on vacation. <laughs> you carry him with you on vacation, wherever you go. We are unapologetic. <laughs> 
that, you know, our worship music and, and all that, it's, it's modern and it's loud. <laughs> you know, our, our church, we, we get our d- DNA from the Jesus movement, right? Big kind of a thing, big component of the Jesus movement was that all of a sudden, uh, these young hippies were writing songs that sounded just like the music that was on the radio, except it was about Jesus now. And they brought it into the church and it kind of freaked people out because it was this fresh expression of praise, but it was different. It wasn't him sounding. It sounded like what was on the radio. And so, so it caused a lot of contention and a lot of, you know, just a lot of wrangling. But, but here's the deal. God used that fresh expression of praise in a powerful way. And he still is. The modern worship movement began then and we're part of it. There should be a fresh expression of praise, and it should be loud and exuberant. Got so many scriptures on this. Psalm 33, 3, sing to him a new song. A new song, a fresh expression to God. Don't just rely on the same old songs that you've had. There needs to be fresh expression to the Lord. And then it says, play skillfully on the strings. So so don't, you know, get your musicians to like practice and get good at it because the Lord is worth that. Like spend time, these musicians in our worship, they spend time practicing and, and honing the gift that God has given them. And that's biblical. That's right. And then it says... Sing a new song with loud shouts. <laughs> Psalm 47, 1. Clap your hands. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. Psalm 150. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. So, so listen. We realize that the music's pretty loud here, okay? But we feel like it's a biblical thing. Now, I know somebody says, well, they didn't have no PA systems back then. Right? So, like, this got to be way louder. Well, listen, if you, we happened to last year when we were in Amman, Jordan, on our Israel trip, we, in the hotel we were staying at in Amman, we come in, and there's a wedding going on, a Middle Eastern wedding, Jordanian people getting married, and we walk in, there's probably 80 people in the hotel lobby, and they're in a circle, giant circle, and the bride is coming down the stairs to see her husband for the first time, never seen him ever. Let me tell you, she did not look happy. <laughs> she did not look like a happy camper at all. It's like, oh, shoot. So, but here's the deal. They had drum the people. There was a whole circle of drums. They were pounding these drums. It was so loud. You couldn't hear yourself talk. It was multiple times louder than what you're hearing here in praise and worship. It was incredibly loud, unbelievably loud and vibrant and joyful, except for the bride. And it was... And so we feel that that's congruent with the scripture and congruent with who our God is. And so for the sake of the gospel, we desire to use, do the best with what God has given us. Steward well our resources. Use the technology that's available. All of it. We want to steward our particular situation. 21st century southern Idaho, United States of America. That's where God has called it. How do I know? Because we're here. That's where we are. (laughs) And so we want to do our best so that we can win some. We want our church to be a place where you feel like you can invite your neighbor and, and they, they're not going to, you know, get turned off or whatever. But 
we need to adapt, and, and, and I believe this about church, contextualizing is, is an ongoing thing. We, you know, as culture changes, we contextualize to the culture. We don't change our message. We don't t- change. Certain things are, are pillars that do not change, but stylistically, there are things that are changeable. And so we want to be open so that we can be the most effective possible. Well, let's move on to the third thing, and that's our responsibility. And I'm just going to read to you a short passage out of Numbers chapter 3 where they're setting up the tabernacle worship. Here's what it says. Numbers 3, uh, verse 6, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses, bring the tribe of Levi near, set them before Aaron the priest that they may minister to him. They shall, watch this, keep guard over him and over the whole congregation. Keep guard over the people goes on, those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tent of meeting and so on, Moses and Aaron and his sons, guarding the sanctuary itself to protect the people of Israel. So in Moses' day, in, when the tabernacle was erected and God's people gathered for worship, there were certain people who were chosen to guard the people, to protect them, to keep them safe from those who would want to come in and harm them. We're living in a day and age that's not all that different from Moses' time. There's been, over the last few years, a number of church shootings where perpetrators have come into sanctuaries like this. Now, though the, the odds, we don't, as Christians, don't typically talk in terms of odds, but the odds of something like that happening here are very remote, but nevertheless, over the last year plus, Pastor Jeff Glenn has spearheaded our security team, and he, with, along with quite a group of people, have been learning and strategizing, working with local law enforcement And uh, they've put together a security team that's made up of former military, former law enforcement, and others. And they are here to protect you. Yeah. So here's, here's what they want you to know. This is from Jeff and his team. We have a plan in place. Security, Sunday school teachers, ushers are provided training to conduct lockdown and evacuation in the advent of an emergency. Idaho law allows for concealed carry. However, our security team will respond. So let the security team take care of any situation. Okay, you follow? So let them handle it. Because in a state like ours, where concealed carry is okie dokie, <laughs> you might be tempted to get involved. And so what they're saying is don't. That more than likely would add to the confusion. So let them handle it. Following the usher's direction will be the biggest help if a situation arose. And so it's important to be familiar with the exits the different areas of the church, parents, your instinct will be to want to go straight to your kids in whatever kid zone they're in. Don't, because they will be being evacuated. You will rally together at a certain rallying point outside. And so the mantra of the security team is to be prepared, not paranoid. Prepared, not paranoid. That's good. So they want you to know that they love you and they are committed to protecting you. They are. So, so not only that, um, you should know that all who serve in ministry here, children's ministry, youth ministry, are all gone through background checks. We take that very seriously. 
Again, in this day and age, there are people who infiltrate churches with evil motives, and we are always on high alert about those kinds of things. Well, that brings us to our fourth thing this morning, and that's our children. I want to talk about that for just a minute. Our children. Matthew 19, 13. Children were brought to Jesus that he might lay his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked the people. What are you doing bringing your kid to Jesus? What are you thinking? Get that kid out of here. And Jesus said, whoa, wait a minute. You need to let the people bring the kids to me. For such is the kingdom of heaven. And the Bible says Jesus laid hands on each and every one of them. Children were obviously a great priority to Jesus. Therefore, children's ministry has always been a priority here at our church. And we want to make sure that our children receive the touch of Jesus and that they become lifelong followers of Jesus. That's the goal. And so... Our children's ministry leaders, Jenny Swafford, Pastor Jason Hauser, um, have fresh vision for our children's ministry. And here's what they want you to know. As a church, we are called to pass our faith down to the next generation. And so here's what the psalmist said, who was passionate about it, obviously, Psalm 71, 18. Even to my old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come. Don't let me die, God, until I've passed on the testimony of who you are to the next upcoming generation. So listen, for those of us who might be on the backside of the mountain of life, this needs to be our rallying cry, is that we need to be committed to passing on our faith to the next generation. So listen, we are using a brand new curriculum called Answers in Genesis that equips our kids in the basis of Uh, for their faith. It helps them to know why they believe what they believe. Not just what they believe, but why they believe. And this is hugely important. Listen, this generation today, it will not accept, well, the Bible, why is that? Why does the, well, the Bible says so. This generation does not receive that. They need to know why. Tell me why. And so our kids are being taught not just what to believe, but why they believe what they believe. Worship. Yeah, amen to that. So worship is high priority as well. And so we are launching a a worship team for children's church, and and we want to help the kids just become passionate worshipers of the Lord, and 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 to and so so Jason is putting together a team of musicians that will lead in children's church on Sunday mornings, and and so there will be a vibrant worship session in the warehouse. Uh, on Sunday mornings where all the kids will be together before they break up and go to their various classes. And so we're very excited about that. And so concerning family, they want you to know that we want to help parents to equip, uh, to equip you to help your children you know, walk with Jesus and so on. And so our mission as a church is to reach the world. The Great Commission begins at home. To make disciples of all nations. That starts right where you live with those kiddos who are in your house. And then there's a culture, kind of a shift that we are in the process of building in our children's ministry. And so we're asking everyone to step up to this. And here's the deal. There's a few things that the children's ministry and and I want you to know. Moms and dads, listen, 
show up to church on time. Here's why. Because at 10 minutes after church has started, the kids are going to be taken from their classrooms to the warehouse for worship. And if you, do, if you show up late, you're going to be sort of throwing a monkey wrench into that whole system. And so we're asking you, Mom and Dad, be committed to being on time to church so that your kids can move with everybody into the worship space to worship the Lord. Also, please wait until church is over, Mom and Dad. Take communion. Wait for the host to come up and dismiss so that your children can get the full class time and those teachers have the full class time. So we're asking that of you. We're asking you to be on board with this because we love your kids. We, we care about your kids and your family. So, so help our children's ministry people to minister well. Would you do that? Also, we're looking for volunteers that are called to teach the word. Have, have you felt just a, a desire to teach God's word? And, and, and so for our teachers, listen, we want our teachers, those who are going to teach the word of God, we want them to prepare. And so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna teach children, we don't want you to come in unprepared and just give some kind of, you know, secondhand leftover kind of thing, but that you'd spend a half an hour or an hour with the, the, the text and with the curriculum and, and be ready so that when you're meeting with the kids, you've got command over, over what they need to learn and what you need to say. The kids are worth that. God is worth that. And so we want to have a culture of excellence in our children's ministry. And we need more helpers and who are going to be in there and assist the teachers and, and enable them to, to teach the children well. So we want people who love the Lord, who love the kids enough that they're going to be faithful. And they're going to show up ready week in and week out. Faithfulness. That's the currency of the kingdom, by the way. If you can't be faithful, if you can't just show up, listen, be faithful in well-doing. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be faithful. In well doing, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. It really matters. It's valuable. Well, the fifth thing this morning, and that's our polity. <laughs> our polity, that's the theological word for governance. Who's running things? How do decisions get made around here? Um, well, here's what they did in the early church. Acts 14, 23, for instance, when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So elders were appointed in churches. This is the, the first century, the early church uh, way of doing things. There were elders who were responsible for the doctrinal health of the church and its people, and there were deacons who were responsible for the ministries of the church, various ministries, and so on and so forth. So here's the, the way it is here. Currently at Lighthouse Church, there's three elders slash pastors, me, Ron Heath, Kevin Newbury, and then there are numerous, there's other pastors, there's other what we would classify as deacons, but here's what I, I want you to see this morning as we kind of unpack the, the polity here, the governance, is that how do we make decisions about how finances are spent here? We have a, what's called a board of trustees for the church that's currently made up of four people. And this board of trustees is responsible for the financial well-being of Lighthouse Church. And so they have control over the finances to approve or not the budget that the elders present. And so their goal is to make sure that we are living within our means. That is, we live within the means that God has given to us through the tithes and offerings of his people. And if we're not, if we're going over, then we have to adjust 
right? We've got to adjust because God is not providing. We can't presume upon God. So we're going to adjust ourselves to that. And the board of trustees makes sure that we adjust ourselves. They are over the, the compensation for the church staff. They determine all these things. It's their job. It's their responsibility. And then there is another board within the church, and that's the board of trustees for the school. And the board of trustees for the school acts in much the same way as the board of trustees for the church. The school has its own budget because the school is a major ministry, 320 kids, and a million dollar plus budget for the year. So it has its own budget, but there's a board of trustees that oversees the finances of the school to make sure the school lives within its means and is wise in how it stewards the resources that God has given it. Now, you need to know that Lighthouse Christian School is a ministry of our church. Okay? It's not a separate thing. It's not a, you know, it's not a, well, there's the school and there's the church. No, there's the church. And then there's the school and Sunday school and youth ministry and all the other ministry. The school is a ministry of our church. Your tithe money, and we'll go to our last section here, and that's our stewardship. Your, your tithe money, we'll talk about this in a second, but it doesn't go to the, to the school. And some people are concerned, well, I'm, I'm, that's not my thing, Christian school, and I, I, I'm not sure I want to give to that. Well, listen, it doesn't work like that. Well, how does it work? Well, let's talk about a couple things. <laughs> First of all, last month, I sent out an email to you all and said, hey, we finished our fiscal year. and We're about $80,000 short of what we thought. And, uh, and so we've had to make some adjustments to live within our means, right? And uh, so here's the question that arises. If we're 80,000 plus short from last year, where does a brand new screen come from? If we're, if, we, if we're that much short, how come we just opened up a $2 million building back there? And I just found out by reading the paper the other day that we put $2 million into that building. Well, how, how does that work? So here's, here's what you need to know. The church lives, exists, thrives, functions off of the tithes of God's people. So the operating expenses of the church, the mortgage payment for this property, the air conditioning, utilities, cleaning, I mean, all of it is taken care of by our, when I say our, me, you, all of us, by our giving. It keeps this place running. So that's what our tithe does. That's what the tithe did in the Old Testament. That's the model, is that you bring your tithes to the storehouse. It takes care of the Levitical priesthood, takes care of the temple uh, you know, make sure everything is taken care of, that the, the parking lot is repaved, that the, the three air conditioning units that went out this summer are replaced. That's not fantasy, that happened. <laughs> and, you know, the parking lot was $55,000 and the air conditioning units were $5,000 plus each and so on. Well, who paid? We paid for that, our ties pays for the operating expenses of the church. Now here's what the board of trustees is really concerned about. And that is, does do everybody in our church understand that? That as a part of Lighthouse Church, that it's our duty to tithe to the church and that tithe takes care of the operating expenses of the church and that offerings are a different thing. Because some people think that, you know, I'm going to take my tithe and I'm going to give it to this, this really good cause over here. Well, at that point, it's not a tithe anymore. So you're not tithing. You're giving an offering to something, and that something might be a great thing, and that's fine. But you're not tithing. 
So there is a very great distinction in the Bible between tithe and offering. So how is it possible that, that if we came up short in last year's budget that we have a new screen? Because a family in our church gave an offering to want to upgrade our situation. How is it possible that the back building has been developed if we're falling short in our operating budget? Because offerings have been given. And by the way, not just from people in our church or people from our church who have kids in our school, but even people from other churches have given offerings to see this back building finished. And so if you, if Lighthouse Church is your church, it is your responsibility to tithe to your church. Are we going to check up on you? No, we're not. But you're going to miss out <laughs> on God's best. So, all that said, gang, on Sunday night, September 2nd, 6 o'clock, our board of trustees, um, they want to just have an open church meeting uh, where they can just kind of go over the finances with anybody who's interested so that you can kind of see where the money goes and understand. And so that'll be on Sunday night, September 2nd at 6 o'clock. And so the Sermon on the Amount is going to happen on Sunday night, the 2nd. And y'all, if Lighthouse is your church, you are invited. And they want to do that maybe a couple times a year. And, and uh, you know, because really, we all have a vested interest in how we're doing, right, as a church. Because we all are part of this. We are working together to build the church. That's the word of the Lord, gang. Are you using good materials? Are you thoughtful? Do you, do you think ahead of time? What, what is my giving commitment? Be thoughtful. That's first, or 2 Corinthians 9. Be intentional. Decide ahead of time. This is how much we're going to give. And then doing that. That's using good materials. That's being thoughtful about how you build the church. So let's pray. Lord, we uh, want to thank you for rescuing us from sin and darkness and purposelessness and bringing us into your marvelous light and making us a part of the church universal, the bride of Christ. And so thank you, God, that you've called us to live out our lives in this local expression of the church and to be builders together with you and to see people make those confessions of faith that hopefully lead to a fruitful life. And Lord, I see across our congregation this morning so many who have been living a fruitful life, not an easy life necessarily, but a fruitful life. Encourage your workers, Lord. Would you do that? Would you give us joy that, that we can come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves? So, God, may we be thoughtful about how our part in building our church, planting and watering, teaching and serving. This matters. <laughs> this is... This is really super important stuff. This is our life. So, Lord, um, encourage us, unify us, excite us, fire us up. Lord, for anybody who's hurting here this morning, heal their wounds. By your grace, just put healing balm. Lord, upon that situation, meet the needs of your people. Lord, for those who don't know you here this morning, Lord, would you introduce yourself? 
Lord, that we could see confessions of Jesus Christ as Lord, the church being built With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, listen, I want to invite you who have never put your faith in Jesus, never personally asked him to be your Savior and your Lord. I want to invite you to do that now. And so, if you are ready to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ who died for you and then rose from death to conquer it for you. He stands at the door of your life and awaits you to open that door. So if you would like to trust in Jesus today for your salvation, would you raise your hand? And I'm going to lead you in a prayer to receive Christ. Raise it up good and high. God bless you way in the back. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. All right, anybody else before we pray? All right, if you raise your hand this morning, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you, that you died on the cross for me. Please come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I surrender my life to you and receive you now by faith. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's welcome those who prayed this morning.